On October 27, 2022, Elon Musk acquired Twitter for the whopping $44 billion. The worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. And of course, he released all the garbage people from the bottoms of the Twitter to set the bird and all of its bird poop free. Then he made an $8 check mark. Then he removed $8 check mark. But then he added it back. Then he banned all of the accounts that pretended to be Elon Musk. And then he outlawed doxing. But then he doxed somebody. And maybe that was all one big joke just for everybody to see Hunter Biden's <laughs> But this video will not be about the unloved man who can't come to terms with his own mortality. Instead, we're going to take a look at this tweet in particular. Elon Musk claims himself to be a free speech absolutist. Calls for the free speech have been on agenda for outright wingers and conservatives worldwide. So what brought this typically liberal and progressive idea into the right-wing politics? Welcome to Propaganda Press. And today, we're taking a look at everybody's favorite freedom of speech. <laughs> freedom of speech, of course, are multicultural, but we are going to start with ancient Greece and Rome. Philosopher Epictetus and discourses of Epictetus are quoted to be one of the origins for the freedom of speech. Philosophers of ancient Mediterranean had a term parhesia. Parhesia is basically a right to speak, but it is also more than that. Parhesia lives together with the Stoic virtues, for which, of course, Epictetus was a strong advocate. Freedom of speech at the time was guided by four basic Stoic principles – justice, courage, truth, and wisdom. But in conjunction with parahesia, there was another term, isigoria. Isigoria is a right to be heard. And generally, I try to concentrate on the written text and propaganda pieces in this series, but today I think we should start with the concept itself. Many cultures worldwide advocate and have their own concept of freedom of speech. Rostra is a structure that was located within Roman Forum. Anybody could speak their own mind on the rostra, of course, if they were able to make it into the forum in the first place. Natives of Northern America have a concept of talking stick. Only one person who is holding a talking stick is allowed to talk, and everybody else ought to listen and try to understand. Different color structures and pieces on the talking stick were meant to empower the speaker. And there are also really heavy mouths, which we still carry in a lot of the Western states. But among all the different platforms that people use through history to represent their freedom of speech, there is a common struggle. Freedom of speech originates as a struggle between people and positions of power. Positions of power are usually represented either by the religious institutions or the state. And for over 10 centuries, there was no significant movements in the West in the relation to freedom of speech. In part, that was because there was no such things as printing press, internet, widespread education, and there was widespread of religious organizations and small power institutions. But Middle Ages brought some shift to the conversation. In 1215, first Magna Carta was created in Britain. Magna Carta gave individual rights and freedoms to the nobility of the time. It still didn't, though, specifically talk about freedom of speech. You could still lose your head for talking about your king. And the next significant shift came several centuries later with the work of two treaties of government by Locke. Locke argued that there are embedded freedoms that are given by God to the people. He called them natural rights, and they included right for life, liberty, and property. And of course, you can see how these three core values proposed by Locke back in the 17th century are still with us today and are at the base of our Western societies. He started to talk about individual rights of people. In 1689, Britain also produced its Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights gave freedoms to people, though only free people. People who were unfree at the time were not considered to have rights at all, and at the time Europe was still well into slavery. British Bill of Rights gave people freedom of speech, but only in the Parliament. Though if you look at how British Parliament runs, they actually still encourage and allow people to argue and scream at each other, and they have been operating government like that for over four centuries. In 1766, Immanuel Kant also stepped into the conversation and talked about personal liberty of freedom of speech. Locke, Kant, and other philosophers talked about individual freedoms of people. And at the time, having individual freedom for regular folk was not something that the state and positions of power seriously considered. And of course, Americans looked at Locke's work and they looked at British Bill of Rights and thought that they'd want to have Bill of Rights of their own. 
and thus they did. James Madison was one of the core figures in the formation of American Bill of Rights and First Amendment. Madison was an advocate and very close to being free speech absolutist, especially considering his times. First of all, he wanted First Amendment to be far wider and allow more personal freedoms. He also wanted First Amendment to cover not just the federal government, but also state government. By the way, First Amendment specifically talks about freedom of speech under Congress and federal government. First Amendment by no means advocates for the absolute free speech on the individual basis. Conversation surrounding freedom of speech was largely shaped by the Supreme Court in America. And on judging of Supreme Court, there are many instances which are not considered to be covered by the First Amendment. And of course, interestingly enough, after imposing Bill of Rights, America straight away imposed gag law. Gag laws barred discussion of particular topics. Gag law did prohibit any discussion of abolition and slavery within the federal government, and all bills were tabled without further discussion. This instance once again shows how severe is this tension between freedom of speech of people, freedom of speech of political figures, and the state. There are limits to free speech between people and state. For example, Canada has laws against hate speech. A lot of European countries have strict prohibitions surrounding free speech and discussion of fascism and Nazism following Second World War. The Majesty laws prohibit people from talking poorly about their government and head of the government. One example of that is Russia, where making a poor comment about government or Putin himself can end you with $450 bill. And of course, further than that, there will be attempts of actual censorship. Golden Shield of China is an example of something that would be completely prohibited under First Amendment. China has a firewall that prevents users on the internet from seeing content and platforms which the state considers to be harmful to people. And of course, let's end with one of the most important works for the understanding of freedom of speech of today and how it actually ended up on the far right. In 1859, Mill produced work on liberty. Mill is understood to be a father of American liberties and also arguably early feminism. Mill examined freedom of speech really closely, and he concluded that freedom of speech is one of the most important values at the core of democracy. He argued that any speech, no matter how immoral, should be allowed to exist. But in his discussion of freedom of speech, Mill found some gaps which he covered with harm principle. He limited some forms of free speech because they were causing harm. And arguments for freedom of speech and harm speech in Mill also have a premise. Well, at the time of Mill, the premise was that freedom of speech was only given to the rich white men who came together in the government to discuss things. Though maybe I can take a more mild take on his freedom of speech argument and say that he actually had a premise of having a reasonable and logical discussion. So Mill definitely did not foresee times of internet post-truth and alternative facts when he was building on his harm and freedom of speech arguments. Though in this discussion over here, you might notice something. Discussion of freedom of speech and our understanding how freedom of speech is, is actually shaped by very conservative dead old white men. For example, John Stuart Mill had no issues advocating for the freedom of property, liberty, and expression of British, but, for example, limited all dead freedoms to people of color in the colonies of England. Locke was advocating against slavery, but simultaneously was benefiting from an African royal trade company that was trading people. It may seem like other conversations about freedom of speech have been moving from liberal left-side politics into the right-wing politics. But you can also argue that it actually originated within this conservative individualism. Elon Musk and a lot of billionaires are very strong advocates for individual rights. This is anarcho-capitalism for the few and whatever is left for the rest. But with that said, let's move a little closer to our current times. So let's look at brief moment when freedom of speech visited left-leaning politics. Free speech and its relation to self-government was published by Alexander Michael Jong in the 20th century. He was a strong advocate and perhaps the closest you can get for free speech absolutism. He argued that any discussion of anything should be allowed under state. He was also father of Wisconsin Experimental College. Experimental College was college within University of Wisconsin. Students were studying with very loose syllables. They were allowed to read what they wanted 
it how they want it and when they want it. They studied together with professors as if professors were their peers. All of the organizational work of the university was guided by professors and students. But the problem was that graduates of this experimental college were viewed to be too radical. As a result, University of Wisconsin wrapped experimental college. The Wisconsin University Liberal Arts Program was, of course, severely influenced by works of Alexander Michael John and continues to live on. Berkeley the alma mater of free speech in 1960s had protests of students that would argue for free speech on campus. They would specifically argue for freedom of political expression and political speech. Students would also question what they were taught in universities. Academia, since its origins, has been very progressive. It was too progressive back in ancient Rome, and it is still too progressive today. Academia has multiple tools such as dialogues, discussions, arguments, student work, peer work, book reviews, and of course scientific method, all of which contribute to freedom of speech and freedom of discussion. Karl Popper shaped discussion of scientific method in our 21st century and end of 20th century. Universities and academia are one of the best representations of the free market of ideas. And yay, we made it to the free market of ideas. Congratulations! Justice William Douglas coined the term free market of ideas. Free market of ideas is a notion that once we put all of our ideas, things, and conversations together, then the best and more correct conversations will come up at the top. And this is what has been happening in academia and institutions since prehistoric times. Ideas of conservative thought, and especially ultra-conservative, with time lost their value on free market of ideas or were partially dismissed. But of course, people who were losing on that free market of ideas were not happy. Specialist by Michael Knowles turns discussion of freedom of speech within the academia. This is a book for Daily Wire fans. It specifically argues that ideas of the conservatism and ultra-conservatism needs to be introduced back into academia. This is an argument for Isigoria from ancient Rome. This is a right of conservatives to be heard. Once conservatives are arguing for equal representation and equality of outcome, without really realizing what they're doing. One good example of that is also Pierre Poivier, who is a leader of Conservative Party of Canada. Yeah, no, we talk about Canadian politics, who cares about that? In part of his platform, Pierre Poivier argues that there should be a governmentally assigned judge who would be overseeing and controlling freedom of speech and press within academia. Pierre argues that we do need to enforce freedom of speech by controlling freedom of speech, and his fans don't seem to have any issues with the said idea. And of course, at the end of the 20th century, internet came into existence. On the internet, there is no real market for for the ideas. On the internet, ideas are fighting for attention, not for rightness. And since I got your attention over here, why won't you check if you like button still works by trying to press on it? In the fields of the internet, attention generates profits. This is also one of the reasons why Elon Musk, I think, uh, released all the outright figures on the platform. Of course, these figures are harmful to public discourse, but they produce a lot of attention for the platform and engage users more. And you, of course, might argue that Elon Musk is such a good figure, he is releasing all those people seeding freedom of speech, but he doesn't. He literally bought himself a platform where only one person now has an absolute control over what can or cannot be said. Elon Musk rules Twitter as a monarch. He cannot be a figure that is advocating for absolute free speech or even actually free speech. And you can say, well, Twitter before it was also regulating and restricting free speech, which of course they did. All platforms on internet are regulating what can be and cannot be said. Some things just don't really fly well with pampers and Nestle advertising. Platforms usually produce terms and conditions which regulate what can be said on the platform, something that you voluntarily agree to when you sign up to platform. But this is still, again, a very short period when freedom of speech visited left-leaning politics. And in the end of the 20th century, Nozick happened. So in the end of the 20th century, liberals and leftists were having fun with their freedom of speech, but the right wanted to be on the party too, which was represented an extremely popular work of Robert Nozick, Anarchy, State and Utopia. In his work, Nozick argues that there are intrinsic inborn rights that we all have. In his very interesting observation, Nozick noted that you actually have absolute freedom of speech. Your tongue is in your head and your head is on your shoulders, and if you are flying through the vacuum of space, Space, you can scream whatever you feel into the void. Up yours, woke moralists. 
We'll see who cancels who. Nozick was able to inhale new life into conservative movements in 70s and 80s. Nozick argued for small state, absolute personal freedom, and free markets. Only three things that sound more 70s than jello salads. Closer to end of life, Nozick, though, did dismiss some of his writings. He was saying that he sacrificed other personal freedoms and freedoms of other people in this attempt to build personal individual freedom heaven. But I find what happens with Elon Musk and his other tech bros really interesting. Simultaneously, Elon Musk wants platform to be absolutely free, but he also wants people to only say things he likes. He imposes rules and bans against people that he doesn't like or that in some way damage him in particular, but doesn't really care about anybody else. So he basically builds platform only around his own personal individual freedom. One of the most notable modern incidents surrounding freedom of speech is in Harvard in 1991. One of the students flew Confederate flag outside of the residency, and Harvard Crimson in newspaper published an article that dismissed and despised that Confederate flag. Harvard Crimson argued the display of confederal flag on residency restricted ability of other students on campus to study, specifically talking about people of color, of course. Director of Harvard at the time failed to address that incident. After that, Charles Mills produced the work which was called Racial Liberalism. He talked about previous philosophers and origins of free speech in his essay, and he specifically noted that how we view and shape our free speech in Western society is often dismissive and oppressive towards other people that don't look like us. When we have discussions about freedom of speech and individual freedoms in the West, we tend to ignore freedoms and needs of other people. This incident with Confederate flag highlights interesting uh, dynamic between liberal politics and fascism and conservatism. When ideas of conservatism and especially ultra-conservative views such as segregation, slavery, and separation of women from the state, for example, fall out of popularity in 20th century, there is only one way for conservatives, ultra-conservatives, and outright to fight for expression of their own ideas. This is under umbrella of free speech. People on the right would argue that their views have a right for equal expression and equal hearing, even though their views are outdated, sometimes harmful, and were dismissed by society on free market of ideas. So we form this train of individual freedom of speech, but not all passengers there are conservatives. Some are actually going a little bit further. People from ultra-conservative, outright Nazi and fascist groups are willing to jump on the same train too. And their argument is pretty fair. They say, well, if conservatives' ideas should have equal representation, why won't ultra-conservatives' ideas have equal representation too? And if you go a little deeper into holes of outright, you can find Nick Fuentes there. He understands that ideas of his uh, white nationalist separated state need to be executed by the authoritarian state. Abortion's popular, sodomy's popular, you know, being gay is popular, being a feminist is popular, sex out of wedlock is popular, contraceptives are, it's all popular. That's all, that's not to say it's good, that's not to say I like that, popular means the people support it, which they do. And, uh, and it sucks and it is what it is, but that's why we need uh, dictatorship. <laughs> that's unironically why we need to get rid of all that. He argues that ideas need to be controlled and state needs to execute those ideas. Nick complaint is that liberalism and neoliberalism are open to representation of ideas of fascism and Nazism and public discourse. Though figures that are siding with liberalism and neoliberalism fail to execute on their ideas of fascism and Nazism. Actually, ideas of Nick Fuentes are not that different from ideas of Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt argued that liberalism opens doors for fascism and Nazism, but because those ideas are not that popular in society, they fail to come to full execution. Carl Schmitt was one of the main theorists and philosophers of the Third Reich. And this is where Elon Musk fails too, so he tries to argue for this freedom of speech ideas, and he tries to be one of those cool guys and hang out with right-wing figures. But on the same side, he is also very hesitant to admit that he is advocating for a control of freedom of speech on the platform to his own will, something that a figure like Nick Flantis, for example, would never have a problem admitting to. And of course, how a conversation of freedom of speech today is very much shaped by existence of the internet. In his recent work, Richard Hassan talks about cheap speech. Cheap speech is what we have on the internet. He 
notes in his book that on the internet, anybody can write anything. Any idea can spread as far and as wide as it possibly can get. So we have abundance of information, which is really cheap to distribute, which form another camp on the freedom of speech train. So we're not just talking about conservative outright, also, a lot of people who are falling into the cracks of conspiracy theories are arguing for freedom of speech too. While conservatives and right-wingers are arguing against Mill's harm principle, they are saying that harm speech should be distributed equally to anything else, the conspiracy theorists instead are attacking Mill's premise, premise being that we need to have reasonable and logical discussion. Conspiracy theorists online are saying that they do have individual right to propose their ideas even if their ideas are wrong. Within the realm of freedom of speech, they are arguing for individual right to be wrong. And if you go on platforms like Gab or Parler, for example, those are main two camps that exist on those platforms. Gab feed is all just racism, anti-Semitism, and conspiracy theories. So I guess somebody should have told Elon Musk that instead of spending 44 billions of Twitter, he could have just registered on Gab and registration there is absolutely free. Teresa Benjen in Mere Civility argues about freedom of speech and our understanding of free speech today. Benjen argues that in all day understanding of freedom of speech, freedom of speech was viewed as a tension between people and state. But today we view it as tension between individual freedom and political, public freedom. On social platforms of today, people fail to distinguish public freedom from individual freedom. For a conservative and conspiracy theorist, only individual freedom exists. This is, of course, very evident in Elon Musk, where he controls the platform according to his own individual wishes, and he thinks that he propagates freedom of speech. I don't know how conversation is going to go forward, but my speculation is that ultra-conservatives and conspiracy theorists will eventually form even tighter eco-chambers. I do foresee internet intervening into reality way more, especially with coming of the Web3. These people will be able to form their own little worlds. They will be trying to form their alternative reality, surrounding themselves with alternative facts and trying to form the world that fits their own views instead of changing their worldviews. And eventually they will try to progress into the maximum disattachment from the real world which is not matching their expectations. In a sense, we might allow ultra-conservatives and outright figures to form their own little platforms, except way cheaper than $44 billion like Elon Musk. If you like this video, consider subscribing. Every second episode that I produce is propaganda press. Otherwise, see you on the next book.